It's Brian Houston Sports Radio Live, your station for Dallas Cowboys football. Brought to you by Tyler Ford. Here's Brian Houston. Hey, hey, hey. How about this cool day today? It's excellent. And a freeze warning for tonight. It's too cool. <laughs> well, you know, here we are. It is November the 12th. It's about time we start actually getting some November-type weather. I know. You know, because I always say this. There's just as good a chance come Thanksgiving Day you're going to be barbecuing in your shorts. Sure. And nothing against uh, nothing against fire ants or locusts and stuff. I like them dead. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You okay. Know, you know, it's just... But, but, and I say that because I've been at stations where when you play the really bad uh, fire ant commercials, you know, where it kills them dead. Right. Bad dead. Right. We've had people complain about that. Are you serious? Oh, yeah. I was like, well, okay. What, the, the fire ants have a lobby now or what? <laughs> Oh, doesn't everybody, man? You're everybody does. Kidding me. Everybody does. Chocolate covered fired ants. Everybody does. Yeah, exactly. All right, whatever. They uh, probably know who Johnny Ballgame is. I bet they do, and they'd go after him with a vengeance exactly. if, they could, if they had a half a chance. If they could catch him. <laughs> Good point. Hey, fire ants can catch anything. I'm telling. Well, it seems that way sometimes. No Too kidding. Bad. You carry them off. Okay, uh, we are going to go to the APEC VIP hotline, cutting edge training for the serious athlete. ApecGo.com. Talking Dallas Cowboys with us today from uh, Rattle and Hum Sports. Matthew Postens, how you doing, Matthew? Fine, Brian, and uh, I got a cousin out in Tuscaloosa, and she tells me the fire ants out there are something fierce. Yeah, and I bet they're really fierce right now. They're all over Nick Saban's butt right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, well, you know what? They are licking their wounds in Tuscaloosa, but uh, uh, they do have the ticket for the uh, SEC title game as long as they win their final two games. So, That's true. Yeah, nice they- feather in the cap for Aggie fans, but... Uh, all you really did was solidify your, your uh, opportunity to go play Texas in the Cotton Bowl. Which would be enough, believe me. Yes. <laughs> I, I think there would be a lot of Aggie fans quite happy with that right now. No question about it. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the Cowboys because we're about the only ones doing it right now. I mean, every, the Aggies have kind of taken all the uh, the gas right now. But uh, there was the Dallas Cowboys actually winning a ball game yesterday at Philadelphia, which, you know, Two weeks ago, I thought, boy, I don't see this happening. But they knocked Vic out of the ball game. Was that really the key to the whole ball game? Was just knocking Vic out? Uh, you know what? Actually, I think the real key to the ball game was they were finally able to get some game-changing plays on defense and special teams. Yeah, I, I heard the play-by-play call during the intro. It was their first special teams touchdown of the year. Uh, Dwayne Harris. I thought that was the play that really changed the uh, course of the football game. Uh, finally getting that game-changing play on special teams, and then they came right back with the interception for Brandon Carr uh, for the touchdown. You know, first real game-changing plays from your defense and your special teams. You know, Tony Romo said it best after the game, when you can get plays like that while you're looking at Polaroids and talking to your coaches, it makes your job a heck of a lot easier. Boy, no kidding. Uh, and they also, like you said, you had the defense actually score some points for you, and that was huge because the Cowboy offense continues to be kind of um, – challenged shall we say uh so the uh, defense did a terrific job yesterday so is this team now looking at having their hopes of really getting to the playoffs or was it just a matter of beating a team that was worse than they were yesterday well i think it was probably a matter of a team being worse than they were yesterday i mean they they got a little bit of a bump from nick Foles after nick lost the game and i think a lot of that had to do with the fact that the cowboys really didn't know who was going to be coming out of the locker room and playing quarterback in the second half. I mean, you had to assume Vic was coming back. You didn't know if he had a concussion uh, like everybody else on TV did. Uh, so I think it took them a couple possessions to adjust to what Nick Foles is going to offer them at quarterback, which is completely different than what Michael Vick offers you. But ultimately, the Eagles are just in a spiral right now. I mean, they've lost five straight. I think Andy Reid's going to lose his job. I think a lot of guys in Philadelphia are going to lose their job when the season's over. Uh, that team, admittedly, is in worse shape than the Cowboys right now. And their GM will actually do something about it. It sounds like it. <laughs> yeah. Well, now, the Cowboys, things are setting up. I mean, you know, I know they're not a great football team, and they still got lots of issues, 13 penalties, for instance. But uh, the schedule is Soft set up. Calls. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the uh, – the bottom line is the schedule sets up perfectly for them over the next few weeks. I mean, they came through this rugged stretch of schedule where they were four out of five on the road. They go out two and three. Now they got the Browns, Redskins, Eagles back to back with a chance to win all three of them. Um, do they take advantage of this? You think, or is this a team that will go right back into doing what they normally do and could come out next weekend and lose to the Browns? 
Well, that's a really good question, and a, and a couple things to take into account. First of all, you mentioned it; it was a very rugged schedule for the first nine games. I had, I had, I felt like they had to go three and two in that stretch you were talking about. Their last five games were four of them on the road. I really felt they needed to go three and two. It really didn't matter to me which three teams they beat. I felt like they had to win three. Uh, that being said, you know Cleveland is a team that theoretically they should beat. Washington is a team that theoretically they should beat. Philadelphia looks like a team that theoretically they should beat. And if they were to beat all three of those teams in a row, well, you look at it right now, that would put them at 7-5 and five with four games to go. The Giants seem to be having some serious problems, especially in the offensive side of the football. It's a one-game race right now in the NFC East. The Cowboys are actually kind of in this, which is strange to say. A couple weeks ago, I really thought they were on their way out, but... Uh, Eight and eight or nine or nine and seven might actually win the division. The thing that leaves me cold is this: they won four games now. They have followed up each win with a loss, and they have followed up each win with a bad loss. They beat the Giants. They go on the road and they lay an egg at Seattle. They beat Tampa Bay. They get destroyed at home by Chicago. They beat Carolina. They commit six turnovers and nearly beat New York and can't or nearly beat New York and they can't do it the final seconds. They have not put together a win streak since this time last year. And until they can string wins together, there's no way they're going to the postseason. I tend to agree with you and they they're just a mediocre football team when it gets right down to it, it looks like. And when you're a mediocre team, things like this happen. Uh, you know, this week they didn't commit any turnovers. They actually forced some game-changing plays. They forced a couple of turnovers, scored, a, scored three uh, touchdowns on defense and special teams. If you had the Cowboys in your fantasy league, you were a very happy camper come Monday morning. But, you know, next week they may turn around and commit four turnovers to the Browns. They've done it consistently for the last year and a half. They, they, they seem to – they don't seem to enjoy prosperity very much. They can't seem to string it together. And, you know, for me, at this point, as many problems as they've had stringing wins together, I have to see it before I can believe it. Right now, I think it's just as possible they lose to Cleveland as it is they win. Totally agree with you on that one. One of the things that struck me yesterday early, because, again, this game was a one, you know, the Eagles led the ball game with a minute to go in the third quarter. So it's it not it's not like Dallas went out there and just pounded on a bad football team. I mean, it took some turnovers and some huge plays that they haven't been getting all year long to win the football game. Uh, one of the things that we saw yesterday, the pass protection again for the Cowboys and Tony Romo was absolutely dreadful. Uh, Romo gets sacked three or four times and for the first time I think it's starting to get to him I mean usually he'll just go and sit on the bench and um, just kind of withdraw yesterday he looked like his hair was on fire he was so aggravated yeah he did look aggravated a couple of times during that game and it was almost as if they took the Eagles offensive line and put it in front of Tony Cromo starting in the second quarter I thought the Eagles offensive line Actually, once they got Michael Vick out of the game for at least one quarter, actually looked like an offensive line. They actually did some pretty good blocking for Nick Foles. I, I think the thing is that teams have figured out the Cowboys on film when it comes to their offensive line. They can't handle a lot of pressure coming at them at once. If you can fill the gaps, especially inside with the guards, uh, you can put a lot of pressure in Tony Romo's face, and that's really the M.O. with Tony Romo. It's not the pressure from the outside that gets to him. It's the pressure that comes up up his face, comes up the middle. If you can put a lot of pressure on him up the middle and, and force him to hurry throws and force him to make decisions uh, like he had to a couple times, just tuck the ball and take the sack, that's how you want to attack him. And right now the interior of the Cowboys line just isn't getting enough protection around him for long enough to allow him to make the decisions he needs to make to throw the football and then they even make it even more complicated pressure up the middle i think would bother any quarterback but romo's got to worry about whether his receivers are going to be where he thinks they're going to be on most routes and so the only guy he can really count on to throw the football to is witten so you got protection issues you got receivers running wrong routes so you know as good as the win was yesterday you still got the same issues yeah, although I thought the receivers did a, a better job being in the right places than they did last week. There, there were only a couple of instances, I thought, during the game where it was clear the receiver ran the wrong route. Uh, 
but but you're absolutely right. And if you have weeks like you had against Atlanta and the Giants where you have receivers running wrong routes, combine that with the protection issues, and it's a very long afternoon for any quarterback, much less one as mobile and as versatile as Tony is. Matthew Postens from Rattle and Hum Sports on Brian Houston Sports Radio Live on 99.3 Talk FM. We saw a couple of things that were a little different. Cole Beasley now the third receiver. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. They mixed Cole into the into the uh, game plan last week against Atlanta. Uh, they didn't start him as the third wideout. But, uh, you know, Kevin Ogletree, aside from the one big game against the Giants in which, you know, Jason Witten really didn't do anything and, and Miles Austin didn't do much, uh, he really hasn't done much of that third wide receiver position uh, consistently this year. So I think the Cowboys, I don't know if they're necessarily auditioning Cole Beasley for that job you know, full time, but I think what they're looking at is they're looking to see if Cole Beasley can give them something uh, a little bit different uh, in some of those certain three wide receiver sets. You know, Beasley's probably not as fast as Ogletree, but I think he's probably just as good at uh, creating space in the slot, uh, taking advantage of... Uh, his quickness, not necessarily his speed, but he's he's got a very good cut, you know, out routes and hook routes and things like that. Uh, I think they're trying to take advantage of his quickness and see if maybe he can create some opportunities. He's not very big; he's only five foot eight, but uh, I think they want to see at this point what he can give them, maybe 15, 20 plays a game, and see if that makes an impact. And based on what I've been reading, it sounds like he knows the playbook. Oh yeah, he he uh, he buried he buried his head in the playbook during training camp. That's one of the things the coaching staff really liked about him. Uh, he probably caught on to the offense uh, faster than any uh, rookie or free agent wide receiver they've had in quite some time. And you know when you play in an offense like June Jones's offense at SMU, the playbook there is pretty thick. So you know he's used to film study. He's used to playbook study. He's used to disseminating it quickly because you know you play a lot of different roles in that offense at SMU. And uh, you know, if you can, the more versatile you can be going into the NFL, the better off you are. And I think the Cowboys appreciate how studious Beasley has been uh, with the playbook and, and, and during the week during practice. So they want to give him an opportunity to see if that all that work translates into something productive. Cowboys announced today. Looks like Kenyon Coleman is out for the season now, ready to undergo surgery to repair a torn left triceps. How big a blow is that? It's significant. Uh, he is he's one of their better run stoppers. He's one of their better interior defensive tackles. Um, the fact that Jay Ratliff is still healthy, uh, that certainly helps you. Josh Brent's had a nice year backing up the two of them. Uh, I think what the Cowboys need at this point is they need to get Sean Lissom more healthy. Uh, if they can get him healthy and back into the rotation at the defensive tackle, uh, I think they can probably make it work around not having Kenyon in there. Remember, at the beginning of the year, uh, they didn't have Jay Ratliff. They just had Brent and Lissamore and Coleman, and they actually did pretty solid work in run defense. So I have to imagine that if they can get Lissamore healthy, that between the three of those guys, uh, they'll be able to handle uh, the run because the Cowboys have only given up two 100-yard rushing games to running backs this year, and they're averaging less than 100 yards rushing as a defense. So they're doing a very good job stopping the run no matter who's in there. Also, a uh, word came down uh, yesterday, one of the uh, pundits on the, the many different uh, pregame shows, uh, Jason Lockenfora, uh, comes on and says that uh, Mike Holmgren uh, could possibly be a successor to Jason Garrett if the, base, if the job comes open. What do you think of that? Well, I saw the same article you did, and, and first of all, for Jerry Jones, thank goodness the Cowboys won because if they had lost, that would be the dominant story today. Oh, man, don't you know Talking about it. Mike Holmgren all day. What, what Lock and Flora reported was that the Cowboys' job would be the only job that would interest Mike Holmgren at this point in time. Now, remember, Mike Holmgren right now is the president and GM for the Browns. He is uh, losing that job at the end of the year. The owners already told him that his contract will not be extended beyond this year. So once the NFL year is over, he's a free agent. It means he can go anywhere. Uh, according to Lock and Flora's report, because Holmgren worked on the competition committee, which is the committee that basically... Um, reviews rules, reviews instant replay, that kind of stuff every year at the NFL meetings. He worked on that committee for a decade with Jerry Jones when he was the head coach in Seattle. Apparently they have a very good relationship. And according to Lock and Flores report, sources who know Holmgren say that would be the one job that would interest him if it came open this offseason. I can't see that happening. I have to imagine it probably wouldn't be happening either. I mean, the whole reason Mike Holmgren left Green Bay, left a Green Bay team that had been to two Super Bowls in a row, was because he wanted more 
say over personnel. That's why he ended up in Seattle. Uh, you know, you notice the next job that he took after he left the Seahawks was he took over for the Browns as their president and GM, which gives him total say over the entire organization. Uh, if Mike Holmgren just wants to get back to his roots and say, you know, just coach and have input on personnel, then it might work. But if he really wants to be a, a Bill Parcells type of coach and, and shop for the groceries, then I don't think that's going to happen in Dallas. Although I will say this, if for some reason Jason Garrett does lose his job this year, in terms of the long-term health of the organization, I think Mike Holmgren would be the best choice. It would just be a matter of working it out with Jerry Jones. He's worked with strong head coaches before, Jerry, uh, Jimmy Johnson and with Bill Parcells. And if you look at the, the uh, personnel identification during those two periods, they did a very good job of identifying talent. It says that Jones isn't able to work with them very long. He worked with Jimmy for five years. He worked with Parcells for four. And then that old ego rises mm-hmm. up with Jerry Jones, and he wants to be able to take credit. So if they get Holmgren, if, you know, if that's how it ends up working out at the end of the year, uh, I wouldn't expect it to be a long-term solution. Well, again, I don't think it'll happen. So does, I guess it doesn't really matter right now. It looks like Jason at least has bought himself five more years after that win yesterday, don't you think? <laughs> I think maybe five more days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, five think, days, five years. In Jerry World, that's all the same, you know? Exactly. If they go out and they lose to Cleveland on Sunday, we're going to be having the same conversation next week. I guarantee of you. course, absolutely. Hey, Matthew, great talking to you, buddy. Appreciate you coming on today. No problem, Brian. Talk to you soon. All right. Matthew Postens from the uh, RattleAndHumpSports.com on Brian Houston Sports Radio Live on 99.3 Talk FM. When we come back, Aggies, Aggies, Aggies. Whoop, whoop. Gig them. Uh, Mark Passwaters from AggieYell.com coming up.